So thank you. I think we got sort of a broad overview and a, a good case example. Now, uh, time for questions and discussion. Uh, hopefully you all have wonderful questions. I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator and kick us off. Um, I'm very interested in something that was briefly touched on in the beginning, but this idea of uh, people on the move or migrants, people moving around, it relates to uh, labor, it relates to sex trafficking, it relates to people who become vulnerable for exploitation and recruitment. Um, you know, how does the programming, programming you've talked about or you might be familiar with take into account um, you know, individuals who are particularly vulnerable to, to trafficking and exploitation? So you have you know, economic migrants, refugees who might be fleeing violent extremist groups, uh, like the video we watched, um, those who are displaced internally in their borders. And within those two, I think it's important to note that there are particularly marginalized groups like youth and women who are especially susceptible to being exploited. Um, you know, if someone is fleeing violent extremism, uh, are they particularly vulnerable to, to trafficking, either labor or sex? Do they end up working, you know, as laborers <coughs> in, in a difficult situation? Um, do, 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 does your programming take these vulnerabilities into account? And so, Vi, I'm thinking especially, or B, sorry, uh, about the push and pull factors you talked about, and then Vincent, the kind of procurement processes you know, do you know who your laborers are, where they're coming from? Is the fact that people are moving easily across borders, uh, accessing labor, other things, does that make it more uh, difficult to assist them and, and find their vulnerabilities? Well, the, the um, <clears throat> what work is, will, will arrive at a job site in different, different ways. I mean, you have, you have TCNs, we call third country nationals. Uh, for example, there, there might be certain Populations that contractors favor: Philippines, uh, India, Mexico. Uh, certain um, there's a there's a large uh, uh, market for Filipino men, just as there's a large market for Filipino women, as Amas in places like Hong Kong and other parts of the world. But <clears throat> it's a, it, it really is a mix. We have some of our major subcontractors, mostly from, from Turkey and uh, Korea and other places, will have their own workforce, which is, they're well protected. Generally, that they'll be well protected. It's when you have the local young men from the countryside that are brought to the capital to work, like in Sri Lanka, just last week. Or you have um, the uh, uh, third country nationals that are brought in by labor brokers. And we see this in a lot of arrivals halls. Sometimes I'll get in an arrivals hall in the Middle East and I'll see a couple of hundred women. And there'll be a long table. There'll be a piles of passports. And they'll be going to a bump, 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 get all the passports done. All the women get up, they go outside and they get into a van. Not a van, a bus. So I mean, there's just a lot of it going on. <clears throat> the workers for the, the World Cup 2022, Google this one. The highest number of workers ever killed in a sports construction site, in other words, for Olympics or World Cup or whatnot, is 68. Right now in Qatar, we're up to 1,400. It's terrible what's going on. Health, sanitation, trauma, uh, dehydration. So Qatar needs 1.2 million between now and 2022. They've got 800,000 young men working there right now. In one month, two years ago, 41 Indian boys died. I use the term boys because a lot of them are just so young. 17, 18, maybe even 16. I, you know, any questions? I mean, just, you know, yeah, just... So, I mean, that's an interesting point, right? Does, yeah. Then the fact that these workers are being brought in, they're not being protected, does that make them, you know, are there trafficking issues, but does it also make them susceptible to recruitment? Do they have grievances against their employers? Is that an interlinkage between, you know, trafficking victims or people who are trafficking and some of these organizations? But maybe, V, you can add as well this issue of people on the move and how does that impact um, their vulnerabilities? Yes, thank you. And I think uh, one key point that Vincent pointed out that really struck a chord with me was that he said not to humiliate anybody. And the issue of um, human dignity is often cited as the core motivation for violence. Is that, you know, my family's been violated, my sister's been violated, you know, my rights have been violated, so I need to 
have justice. And in the absence of a mechanism for that justice, uh, it drives extremism, violent extremism. Uh, in addition to you know, uh, Vincent's discussion about how best to, to support the uh, employment and employees, uh, maybe I can ask you how do we get the same budget for all our programs. <laughs> I, will, I, I will admit we have a lot of money and I use it. Um, in my 25 years, I've never gotten pushback from any administration, any Secretary of State, no Assistant Secretaries on money. Vincent, whatever you need, you have. So what they mean is what I have is that I, I, can, I, I write the contracts. The, the, the piece that goes out to the contractors, I write it. I put it in there. We have what we call a Division One. The Division One reflects a lot of what is in the executive order, what's in our procurement regulations, and what's in our U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Safety and Health Requirements Manual, some of the things that come out of OSHA, National Fire Protection Association Code 51B, all of the, all of the um, U.S. codes, a lot of that stuff goes into the bank. But we pay for it. Contract it doesn't say, well, that's going to cost a lot of money. Put it in the bid. Give the same playing field for everybody. We've been very lucky. Now, when it comes to the subcontractors, Overseas, they're required to comply with the same contract that the American contract is signed. However, you do run into some friction at times. Because remember, when you're working internationally in the construction business, your construction CEOs have a direct link into the parliament, the barracks, and the palace. When you talk to CEOs, construction companies say, oh, my cousin, you know, Amir Mohammed is a general in the army or so-and-so is, uh, uh, you know, in the Ministry of uh, uh, Economic Development, or, you know, one of these, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fine line. What you gotta do is you sit down, get the tea out on the table, listen to what they have to say, you appeal, you appeal to, the, to, the, to the teachings. I don't wanna go back to the, really, I don't wanna go into it too much, but go into the teachings, use the teachings and what's said in the teachings and how it's supposed to be in terms of, 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 of Islam uh, or in Judaism. I got we're gonna have we're gonna have Jewish contractors doing the embassy up in, in Tel Aviv, I'm sorry, in Jerusalem next week. But you know, all of these kinds of things, you have to appeal to the good offices. You can't demand, you can't cajole, you've, you've gotta you gotta kinda convince you appeal to the better instincts. And, and it's sometimes tough. Generally, I do okay. You know, it's it's a crapshoot sometimes. So again, I think uh, yeah. That's yeah. So in addition to yeah. the best practices that uh, Vincent has shared um, from the development uh, programs, it makes a huge difference. Um, by migrants, it depends on what you mean. How? What's their role with within the context of VE, right? Um, if you are talking of VE as a driver of migration, such as David brought up earlier, then the issue is, what do you do with those victims? Um, if they are trafficking victims, what, what do you do once you rescue them? You don't have a venue of repatriation or reparation. Uh, actually, where do you put them, right? Uh, but if you also look at VE as, uh, as the exploiter of migrants, then how do you access that community? Um, what, what, how do you rescue them, right? And how do you implement program that reaches them? So they are very similar, but they are also very different. And they uh, interact in a way that makes it much more challenging to address one issue or the other. Thank you. I want to open it up. Any questions? Yes, please do. Yes, I got a question for both me and for Patrick. Um, how do you define violent extremism? And what makes it different from violence, from criminal violence, from political violence? So in um, something I failed to mention earlier is that in our uh, development response to violent extremism and insurgency, uh, violent extremism is defined as advocating, engaging, preparing or otherwise supporting ideologically motivated or justified violence to further social, economic, and political objectives. 
So that's the angle through which USA see violent extremism. <laughs> yes, please. Um, oh, <clears throat> I'm going to go with that. <laughs> that's a great. Um, that's a great definition. Um, the one piece I'll just kind of tie in, or really kind of zero in on, is the is the ideology. I think that is um, that is a big difference between kind of the criminal element. You know, the, the criminal element, at least from a trafficking perspective. Um, that we see most often is, is they're driven by grief, driven by money. Um, on the, the violent extremism side, that's not what they're driven by. Um, and again, this is just this is kind of my personal um, belief from what I've seen in, in my experiences, is on the terrorism side, very much geared towards ideology. On the, the trafficking side, much more geared towards financial profit. Yes, Ray. And actually, maybe the point of question that uh, follows as well is because as I was listening to both of you, I was starting to think about, well, what's one of the best ways to counter violent extremism? And one of them may be a job, right? So young guys with guns or can get guns, if they've got a job and, again, gainfully employed, they might be resistant to some of the ideologies that might convince them to do things that might not be in their own best interest, right? So, you know, and, and, and just thinking back, uh, and also particularly those who are demobilized from war. So if we go back to 1920s and 30s, now the rise of Nazism hinged on the fact that there were demobilized troops, uh, German troops, uh, one of whom was a corporal, and uh, it started off the Nazi party and, again, paramilitary groups. And, you know, if we look at Iraq, right? So after the invasion, we have debathification. So all of these unemployed uh, officers and uh, a whole lot of soldiers who, you know, had no future in the new Iraq find themselves in the insurgency in Anbar province and, again, become Al-Qaeda in Iraq, right? And, and they're the precursors of ISIS. What does ISIS do? Well, they take a different tactic in terms of establishing a caliphate and, and that territory. And what happens in that territory? Well, extortion of businesses that are around kidnapping of people who have the resources to be able to pay a ransom, and of course, oil production and smuggling. So that's part of how they ended up operating. So I'm wondering to what extent uh, does the State Department as real estate developer, <laughs> you know, is this a part of countering violent extremism explicitly viewed as employment? And the same thing, I think it's much more so in USAID as a key issue is employing people who might be susceptible. Well, we require the contractors when they submit the bids to tell us where each percentage of the workers are coming from. We want to see at least two-thirds local. Mm -hmm. We know that they've got to have supervision and uh, 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 management coming from maybe another third country. But some of our contractors have done a lot of work for us, and so they, 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 they chain link workers from different uh, uh, places where we've, they've already built a compound. But we absolutely want to know and require that the contractors are hiring locally. Uh, we have security people on site that do the vetting as best we can with a local force. The guards at the gate, they're usually seconded from the embassy anyway, they, you know, the Wacken Hut uh, companies, an international uh, security firm. But there's a lot more in what our requirements are than I've been able to discuss this morning. You know, we're trying to we're trying to plug the holes with that Division One. You know, every year we revise the Division One in the contract documents to cover something we didn't cover before. But then I'm just thinking, Colin, uh, all of the, the workers who worked on the U.S. Embassy in Iraq or any other diplomatic facilities, if they're local, these are people who aren't otherwise. Oh yeah. 
you know, perhaps susceptible to doing other things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, we chased, we chased the, the Taliban at the Tora Bora in 2002, 2003. When I went out there, we, we were hired right away. We hired locals to do some of the, uh, 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 the, the, the labor grunt work that we had. We had a really old embassy there that was being taken care of over the years. But we, we, we tried, we opened it. And so uh, we, we had to use local labor to do you know, some of the unskilled labor work. Uh, one of the things, if I can just share it with you, there was an older gentleman there. And that's the other thing is, when you have go to a construction site and you, you see a lot of construction workers, always go to the older gentleman, shake the hand, because that's where the respect is. I'm telling you, you know. <clears throat> uh, but this older man, he was uh, probably in his 70s, and he was just pulling you know, dirt off the truck. And I went over and I shook his hand. And just, you just could feel, you just could feel the, the, uh, 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 the hard life in his hands as it went right through here, you know. Uh, these guys know, they, they, they want to work and they want to work hard. Uh, repatriating money back, to, back home. One of the things that we try to do is when they're coming from third countries, or even though we try to facilitate mail, you know. I mean, some of these things are, maybe that's why we got a lot of Peace Corps people in the State Department <laughs> and AID. Because they, you know, they, 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 they can, they can empathize with a lot of these, these, uh, these things. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna yeah. add on that I mentioned that uh, for USAID, we are always thinking about sustainability. Yeah. So what happens after the construction work ends? Mm -hmm. How do we promote a local economy that will sustain that approach and, uh, you know, continue the work, so to speak, once we're out? There was a question in the back, I think. Yeah, good morning. Um, I'm uh, a student at Aldi Law School, and I'm writing a paper on trafficking, local, um, national, and then local area. Um, Mr. I want to say, I want to mention Dr. Abramo. Yes. Um, I'm interested in the procurement um, resolution you were discussing. How do they monitor and ensure that once there's a procurement bid, that there is no I mentioned before we had that Foreign Service Construction Engineer. And we'll generally have two Foreign Service Construction Engineers. They are the COR, the Contracting Officer's Representative, or the GDA, the Government's Designated Authority. Okay, so when you see that, you know, when you, when you Google into the websites, there are requirements in the State Department under the PIP that require our Contracting Officer Representatives to quarterly do inspections of housing. I, I look at the recruitment, the recruitment document when it comes in and to make sure that a certain percentage of the workers are interviewed on a quarterly basis if, if, to show if things are okay. The other, things, the other things that we do is we have, we have uh, a safety and health program managers. We have uh, people on site that are listening and doing and we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that no one skates on, the, on, on fulfilling the, the required requirements in the proposal or in the contracts. If they do, we have authority to stop the work. Now when you stop the work, that gets everybody's you know, bell got rung. I mentioned last night to Gina, got a problem this week, actually I was dealing with it uh, yesterday when I, when, I, when I went into work. We had workers in, on one job in um, Libreville, Gabon, that walked off the job and they were threatening a, a protest on the outside of the fence. Come to find out that the American contractor, the American contractor was not paying them for a month. That's absolutely unheard of. Because when we look at our contractors, they're pre-qualified to bid. Not every contractor can go to the Commerce Business Daily and bid on our work. They're pre-qualified. 
We look at their statements, we look at their cash flow, we look at a lot of things in terms of are they capable to perform the work. When the technical proposal comes in, they list the resumes, the education of all of the people that are going to be on the job. I mean, there's, there's, there's no guarantees, but we're trying to, over the years, we've tried to plug the loopholes. Other questions? There's one over on the side. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to follow up on something uh, we just asked a moment ago um, about how if we're viewing labor as a potential development um, and saying that we might be avoiding the E if we have employed individuals, what is happening after the jobs are complete, um, especially in the case of maybe repatriation? Are they experiencing these great services, being repatriated and striving, or are they experiencing these great services, repatriating and feeling disenfranchised and then even more susceptible to be? You know, it's a mixed bag. Um, <clears throat> the uh, um, uh, workforce the local workforce is trained. Like I said, we have the best tools, equipment, and machinery. JLG lifts and bulldoze, I mean, the good stuff. It would be nice if the countries were stable enough to attract foreign investment. Now in places, I mean, I can go through the 76, 79 countries, and I can say, well, those that are gonna be working on Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or whatnot, they got plenty of jobs. In Colombo, we had some people leaving the jobs, because our job, because they didn't wanna go through security. They went to another job even though it paid less because they just didn't want the security business. Um, so the, the Mexico City, for example, we're breaking ground in Mexico City. We're gonna have a hard time getting labor because the labor market's pretty good. But when they do finish, they're a little bit more employable. I've got a program on the sites with the contractors, American contractors, kind of a little job core program. You teach, get a couple of the young people, if they, they want to, if they want to learn something, we put them in the sheet metal shop, we put them in the electrical shop, the carpenter shop, the welding shop. Uh, we were doing the job in Haiti several years ago, just before the earthquake. We had different shops set up and we were teaching some of the young, young people how to weld and do other tasks. Some places you can get a job as a welder much easily because there's so much, there's so much theft in the capital that everybody's putting steel bars on the windows. So they're all looking for, for, for welders to do the work. Uh, in, and this, this is a very more of a comment, but in the, in the days with, with, uh, with uh, Ebola and AIDS, big demand for coffins. So they're teaching good skills in terms of, well, I used to get off, off the plane and I'd be going from the, from the, cap, from the airport to the, the capital and rather than seeing, you know, the uh, uh, objects, I'd see caskets along the road. You know, it's it's just um, if you if you if you, I always say to some of these young people, learn some of the masonry skills because you can always find something doing masonry, um, carpentry, depending on whether or not the country has good resources in wood. I mean, it just gets, but it can happen. But is it very successful globally? To answer your question, no. And maybe V, are there examples from AID of, of more sort of yeah. the same issue of sustainable skills? I mean, is, is jobs enough? There's a very sort of simple, we give them jobs, they will be recruited, but there's more to that perhaps um, from the development perspective. I think I think it definitely is works. It definitely works. Yeah. Uh, but the sustainability question is to whom, yeah. for whom, right? Uh, the issue that we face with, particularly in supporting nascent civil society but, and in challenging environments like close environments and limited uh, livelihood resources and government support, is that once you train that capacity, that person leaves the community. Uh, particularly in terms of program management, civil society support, once they get capacitated, so to speak, they get recruited to international development organizations, they get pulled to the UN, and suddenly you're back at square one. So the question is not how do you provide the training, but how do you improve, how do you raise the water in the region and not specific votes? And unfortunately, you, you will never have enough resources to do everything for everyone at once. So, you know, how do you engage in a way that is sustainable um, at the same time? 
Um, I just added a, a comment. I've done a lot of work in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the linkage between giving jobs as a means of the uh, fighting violence, it was so central that the Department of Defense operated programs and gave out millions of dollars of bank work to take the young people out off the streets and give them a job. And the challenge in those environments, as as um, this and we both kind of alluded to, is you provide the training, you give them skills, you give them a job for a certain period of time. But if the economy doesn't pick up and manufacture private job, jobs, you have the problem that they're thrown back out. And in terms of development, that's one of the reasons and that's one of the challenges. In the United States, we think of development by law as a three to five year project. You know, you cannot award a contract in development beyond five years. You have to be it. And we think of quick fixes. And in order to turn over uh, an economy, in order to promote development, you're talking about a long-term investment. And Americans just aren't patient. Yes, yeah, sir. Other questions? Yeah, please do. Uh, this question is actually here for Vince. Um, so first of all, I want to commend you on how uh, in, the, in the U.S. government construction you took a systematic approach to uh, capturing uh, trafficking. And I work quite a bit on uh, in, in my work in economic, in my work in international development. Uh, a big focus of my work has always been supply chains. And so I think that the work that you've done uh, in in sort of setting up procurement regulations that. Um, address this whole issue of uh, trafficked labor, exploited labor, can actually serve as an example to private sector actors who are operating uh, in those same countries. Um, but I, the question I have is, did you find in places where there's more violent extremism that you have to be extra, more vigilant as far as uh, you know, making sure that these uh, contractual obligations are adhered to, like for example, do you, do you find that you have to do more site visits and so forth? Well, you know, we're, we're, we want to protect the inside of the perimeter fence. So we're, we know, we're, we're secure. Uh, most of our jobs now, what we do is if it's a new embassy compound, rather than having chain link fence or, you know, a, a temporary fence, first thing we do is we put up the, the permanent perimeter wall. We do the same thing in Jerusalem, we put up the perimeter wall. Uh, perimeter wall is going to be pretty high. Uh, so we, we try to, in all, all areas where there's potential threat, uh, you know, State Department identifies quite a few places around the world high risk. We have uh, uh, regional security officers, we have, uh, you know, a lot of intel that, 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 is, that we, we, we tap into when we get ready to start a project. Uh, but we control all of the security, State Department controls all the security. But in terms of, you know, every worker has to go through an ACF, Access Control Facility, every morning. We have Americans that, that take their ID and give them a U.S. government ID if they're going to be coming on a compound. They go through x-ray. They go through iris scans. We have iris scans on the job, so every you know every worker has there are a set of steps that they have to go through before they get from outside inside the compound. But here again, the weapons of opportunity are there. As I said, you know the the drywall knife or the or the axe or the or the hammers or whatever. And of course, we have a lot of gasoline, diesel fuel, epoxies, mastics, adhesives. See all of these things I got to look at. Because they are, they can be weapons of opportunity. Um, you could start something on the first floor, work through the embassy, and just cause a lot of smoke, where we have a lot of the major functional projects. So, it's you know, it's it's a it's every day, you don't know, just like we don't know. You know, yesterday it's a Waffle House, tomorrow it can be a McDonald's. Right? It's just it's, it's terrible what's going on, and a lot of young people they're frustrated. Um, don't have anything. And I remember my sociology class here in Albany was, what was the term, anomie? 
you know, this alienation, this sense of alienation. I mean, that struck a chord with me when I was here 50 years ago. <laughs> so it's tough. But um, we, I, you know, the other thing is visit the sites, talk to the workers. That's very important. Up until a couple of years ago, I was the only one doing what I did. So they gave me a couple more third party contracts to work with. They're two good guys. But the one thing I said, when you go to the site, get the workers together. If you get 300, you break them up into the groups. You thank them for being there. Thank you very much. We wouldn't be able to get the work done without you. Don't be afraid to tell us if there's something that you're asked to do that you're afraid to do, like working in heights and protective edges and so on. All of these little things. The, uh, the fact that the American people appreciate what you're doing. This is your job. You know. In uh, Mexico, uh, one of our projects in Mexico, it might have been uh, Monterey. A few years ago, we had pictures. The workers brought in pictures of their families. And uh, we basically said, you know, look at every day when you go out the door and work safely. At the end of the job, we said, everybody's got a picture of you and their family. Bring the families onto the site. We're going to have a barbecue. We're going to have something. We're going to have an event. Our workers get cash awards every month for working safely. We raffle off motorbikes, scooters. Um, we get the contractors to, to raffle off some of the vehicles at the end of the job to the workforce. All of these things have the effect. A lot of times, cash awards may not work. So what you do is you, you, you raffle off maybe 100 pounds of food, rice, cooking oil, you know, spices, whatever. And believe me, it, 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 it goes a long way. A lot of these different things that we do, um, and our contractors, they go along with a lot. <clears throat> we'll pay for it. <laughs> we'll pay for it. And I don't want us to say, you know, it just what we're trying to do, you just, you know, you do the right thing. And it'll, 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 it'll have the effect of significantly reducing them. Maybe someone will come to us. They know that somebody's going to, you know, send a concrete truck in uh, next week with a load of explosives, and that somebody's going to hold one of the local guards that's on duty, hold his whole family hostage. And if you don't let the concrete truck in, we kill the whole family. So all of these things we have to deal with every day. And you have to deal with corruption too. There's a lot of things, you know, everybody's getting their cut. People say, well, why don't the workers make X number of dollars? Well, we, can, we only pay so much above the prevailing wage rate. You pay any more than that, then they become a target. Mm. Somebody stops them coming home to take, like for example, in Haiti. We had, we had the project site nurse was almost beaten to death because on, on payday, she got in a jitney bus to head down downtown Port-au-Prince and somebody knew she had money in her, in, her, in her purse. So all of these different kinds of things, you know, oh, then what we did in Haiti was we decided we're not gonna pay the workers, we're gonna, do, we're gonna deposit in a bank for them. So that it was protected. So what I'm really saying to you this morning, all of us, that we're gonna be working in this field you know, you got to look at some of the practical things, and sometimes you really got to go out of your way to make it work. Uh, thank you. I actually sort of a follow-up question to what uh, Vince was talking about uh, to me. Uh, Vince is talking quite a bit, actually, in a way about um, giving people dignity, uh, you know, and also bringing people together so that they sort of you know, let go of the otherness. You know, the workers become close to the Americans, the Americans become close to the workers. And so that helps to sort of um, let people go of the otherness where these are them and this is us. And so, um, V, I was just wondering, I know that, um, like as we just talked about, uh, when people talk about extremism, often they think the root is economic. And it probably is in many ways. There's some probably groups that are economic. But more and more research is, you know, is showing that it might be this feeling of being disenfranchised, your dignity is being taken away, and this people beginning to see each other as others. And I'm wondering, is uh, USAID doing any kind of uh, work around that? Are you, are you doing any kind of interventions to address that uh, in addition to the economic uh, issues? Uh, of course. And, uh 
the first thing that comes to mind is uh, what I previously mentioned is the access to justice, right? Uh, providing uh, legal support, uh, strengthening the judiciary, uh, allowing the community members to have redress for uh, whatever that uh, their grievances may be, and in some cases, very heinous human rights violations. Um, the other one is promoting community cohesion and reconciliation work, which may be you know, as simple as uh, hosting uh, theater or sports events that encourages uh, cross ethnic, cross community engagement and then collaboration. Um, providing a safe space for the community is key <coughs> for us, uh, particularly when it comes to human rights because people are usually not comfortable discussing how they've been violated in public. So for issues such as GBV, trafficking, uh, you know, any of those issues, you need to first build the trust, build the environment, so that people are comfortable seeking help first, not even disclosing, but seeking help. And then over time, you may come to learn what are the core issues that's driving their need for support. Um, and I will connect that back to the previous question about how do you monitor right, uh, compliance. And uh, the legislation and COR, uh, site visits, uh, indicator reporting, all of that is one mechanism. But we also stand up a um, technology-based approach, uh, you know, anonymous uh, hotlines for calling, uh, ur um, early warning systems, for people who feel threatened or unsafe. Uh, so all of that we do support through our human rights uh, work. Um, in fact, we also have emergency response mechanisms for when human rights defenders, uh, activists are threatened. Uh, we can provide emergency grants for shelter and uh, mobility to get out of the environment, <coughs> so to speak. So yes, uh, safety and particularly do no harm where we hope that our programs do not unintentionally exacerbate the situation and promote violence for the community uh, are key to, to our programs. Yes, in the back. Does USAID have any program where they directly provide education and training and other services to the refugee camps? Yes, definitely. Um, uh, it depends on, on their needs. Uh, refugee camp is kind of a mixed issue because you are having humanitarian assistance mixed in with more capacity building and civil society support, and then mixed in with supporting the host government's response or other donors' response. So um, it's a complicated uh, coordination effort between different agencies and direction uh, and offices and different funding streams, right? Uh, Vincent present on um, our uh, funding for embassy building and construction. I work on democracy, human rights, and governance, but we also have a big budget for humanitarian assistance, Department of State, uh, PRM manages uh, migration issues. So it depends on what it is but we try to coordinate across different streams to make sure that everything that the community needs is, is addressed. With regard to tier two and three nations, how do you deal with that in the sense of refugee camps if they're already located? You mean tier two and three in, in yeah. terms of trafficking report yeah. identification? Um, I think tier two and tier three guides more longer term development programs, uh, such as you know uh, tra anti-trafficking efforts for the government, uh, working with civil society. When it comes to refugee camps, uh, it's usually treated more as a human humanitarian assistance angle, and they follow a different set of legislation to mandate their work. Uh, but from my office, we have supported human rights, uh, uh, access to legal support for refugee <coughs> camps, and also supporting research into the issue of uh, missing migrants, where uh, we want to monitor 
where the migrants disappear to once they leave the camp or, or once they are forced from the camp. And uh, a lot of it uh, reflects uh, how the trafficking or migration patterns as they change. And we want to uh, be sure that we know how the context is changing to inform our programming. There's a question on this one. Maybe not. And over here. Yeah, in the past. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if you could speak a bit to um, the link that USAID is sees uh, between um, countering violent extremism and the degree to which uh, citizens have a voice in the effective government institutions. Um, <coughs> strengthen their capacity to participate in governance and uh, 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 promoting transparency on the government side and accountability on the government side to the local communities. So that's as basic as you know, supporting uh, free and fair elections. Uh, and when it comes to violent extremism, for us, that's when the whole social contract has already broken down. So you know, it's basically on the extreme end of where there's lacking of uh, social participation. Um, and depending on the context, that's why in our strategy, the first step is assessments and research and learning of the context and the root drivers of violent extremism. Depending on what the context is, it will tailor our approach or response to it. Uh, so I can't give an you know, umbrella answer to it because it's so uniquely specific to the situation. Is there a question on the side? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I know you have touched upon forcibly displaced people due to violent extremism, and I was just wondering if we have any information on um, kind of the protection of these people, because as you mentioned, there is no stable place for them to return to, and so is are these people more susceptible, would you say, to grief, and are these people do these people have the same opportunities to kind of work? for um, US regulated projects um, or construction projects or similar? Yes, those are you know, great approaches. Uh, usually what, what happens is you run into resource challenges. Um, for example, right now in Cox's Bazaar in, in uh, Bangladesh where you've got uh, half a million to a million refugees into Bangladesh, which inherently uh, may not have the capacity and the economy to accommodate all those people, uh, what can we do to strengthen the host government's capacity and at the same time provide the needed resources to, to the refugees right, or uh, migrants? Uh, the other issue, too, is the relationship between the the migrating community and the host community. Uh, when you've got such a large influx of people, um, you face with you know service delivery issues. You face with uh, increased numbers of conflicts. Uh, and how do you address it in a way that's fair for both sides? Um, and sometimes when the when the uh, 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 ethnic ethnic groups are different. You've got a clash in culture, practice, religion. And so it, it becomes very complicated. And uh, we do the best that we can with the resources that we have. Unfortunately, we usually do not have the resources to address issues as holistically as we want to. I might add to, I think it, it matters when looking at people fleeing, migrating, uh, their, what their movement is defined as will, will um, equal what kind of protection they're allowed. So Bangladesh is a great example. Bangladesh is not a signatory to the refugee convention. So even though you have all of these people coming from Myanmar in there, 
there's only one or two maybe now official camps where the United Nations is allowed to provide assistance where those people are registered, but instead because they don't actually officially recognize any refugees, there are these kind of camps that pop up and there's issues and they call them migrant workers, they don't call them refugees. And so there's different protections under the law that you know refugees who are recognized as such can receive versus migrants, versus people who are perceived as just you know being <coughs> trafficked or those who are officially working and, and so those issues too when it comes to protection I think it's important to look at the kind of global definitions. But then also to ask does it matter? If people are moving across borders, they need protections why should only some get certain access? And it also raises those issues of a refugee in a refugee camp will often get better assistance than the local population just outside that's not displaced, but maybe living in poverty, maybe affected by violence. So these definitions are important, but they also equal different access to services. No, very, very much so. And sometimes it drives conflict even within the camp, within the same people, right? Um, if you consider LGBTI status as uh, needing extra protection. What about women and girls against GBV? And then the question is, why do those people deserve better treatment? You know, uh, who gets a visa to be a refugee and get removed from the camp and who does not? So it gets very complicated. Mm. And then add the layer, the stigma of being labeled a terrorist. You know, young people in some communities, depending on the culture, depending on what's happening, may be stigmatized also and may not reach out for assistance. So I think all of these different labels that get attached are important to kind of maybe tease apart. And that might be another place where there is an intersection between, you know, trafficking victims. Um, and maybe to add addition, I think there are people who may be trafficked who end up becoming traffickers. So is it so easy to just categorize people as being victims and perpetrators, or it's more cyclical than that? You know, or people may be smuggled uh, for economic reasons, they may end up being actually trafficked and there's a criminal element added to it. So it's very, there's a lot of layers happening, I think. Um, we have about five more minutes for questions. Uh, any other issues anyone wants to raise? Yeah. I want to also go for a second round here then. Um, <laughs> coming back to this issue of dignity as a factor for violent extremism, I was wondering if, but when you think about this, and I think David mentioned this a bit in the beginning of these questions. To what extent uh, does trafficking and labor and labor exploitation, is that a factor for increased violent extremism? And I'm wondering particularly in uh, the, uh, among the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, where we have some of the, again, largest numbers of contract workers who are coming in, and, you know, let me get this right, uh, Vince. It was 1,400 workers on World Cup facilities that yeah. died? Yeah. I mean, in the, last, in the last three years. In the last three years. So if we think about uh, what kind of labor exploitation is occurring there to enable this to happen, think about the issues of human dignity and how that might affect uh, the communities that those people come from. And one thing, too, just to uh, layer on this a bit more, and this is something that I learned from one of my students from Saudi Arabia several years ago, is that in addition to the contract workers that come to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, et cetera, is that uh, Saudi Arabia hosted some one million unauthorized migrants from Yemen who were in some times because, again, they worked in status, they weren't legally there, were even much more susceptible to exploitation. To what extent did that uh, reality bring on um, recruits to you know, rebellion and rebellions against, uh, again, the Houthi rebels and others in, in Yemen? That, again, has led to conflict. So, you know, you know, we were talking about violent extremism leading to trafficking, but what about the other way around here? Uh, we want to be very careful about the labels. Yeah. Uh, the key difference is, uh, as Patrick you know, confirmed earlier, is the ideology. Uh, people who do not have livelihood, people who struggle to find uh, um, meaningful labor and good protection of labor rights, uh, don't usually resort to violence. They may demonstrate, they may uh, yeah. you know, uh, find alternative livelihood. But the key of violent extremism is the ideologically driven uh, toward violence. And so 
I guess, you know, labor activists may become violent extremism, I guess. But uh, I don't, yeah, it's, to me, it, it, tends, it hasn't really converged. Um, the other thing, too, is in terms of labor. When you've got a large number of incoming labor migrants, usually the country is stable. It's good. There's a reason for people to come. So you don't have the violent extremism in there. But on the way, they may face that. They may come from that. So you said Saudi Arabia hosts uh, a large number of migrant workers from the Horn of Africa. And usually they have to go through Yemen. And you know they face, they may not be driven by VE, but they definitely have to face it along the way. So um, I see it more of an intersection than a cause of effect. Well, first I would just say is that in terms of labor activism, there's a distinction between socialists, for example, who would, would go for liberal democratic means, and then communists who are talking about overthrowing governments and using violence, so there's a long history of that, for starters. But I was thinking more in terms of against, uh, again, the ruling regime of the monarchies, etc., and that that might lead to, again, uh, more radicalized groups it, it depends on how you see it. Like Cambodia is increasingly identifying the labor movement as you know, anti-government. So I guess it depends on who makes the laws. Sure, who decides. Any last burning questions? Yes, in the back. Thank you. I'm so glad you're having this. Thank you everyone. Uh